Hello, students of Dynamics. This is Dr. Dan Baker. And today's example is going to go over this idea of work and energy, including some external work, which is going to come into the system. And I think this is a great example because it has a spring, it has kinetic energy, it has gravitational potential energy, it has kind of all the different pieces that we could have um, for an overall system. And so just to orient ourselves, note first that this is the side view of our system. Basically, side view is really just telling you, hey, you need to include gravitational potential energy. You need to include the height change. And so what we have is we have a collar. This collar is going to start down here at point A. And a 50-pound force is going to pull on a cable attached. Now, this is a, a massless cable. It's probably going to get a lot more complicated if there's a mass to this cable. But a massless cable pulling. Uh, and technically, it doesn't matter what direction it's pulling. It could be pulling up at this angle, horizontal. Um, it's just pulling at 50 pounds as the collar slides from A up to B. Now, as the... Um, collar gets close to B, it's going to hit this spring at about six inches from B, and it's going to come here to B, which is basically um, down here below point C. We actually have a right triangle. A, B, C is a right triangle, and we want to know what is the velocity at B. We do not assume that it stops, but we do know that the spring constant is 200 pounds per foot of this spring. Okay, so collar slides up, hits spring, slows down, but doesn't stop. We want to know what is the velocity of that collar. Um, because this is a kinetics problem, we're going to create a free body diagram. We're going to analyze those forces, determine any of those that might need to be included as the external work term, which I've already given you a bit of a hint here. Why is force P the only term included um, as that external work? And then the last thing that we do know is that rod AB is friction-free, so that basically means we'll have no friction as the collar slides from A to B. All right. So given that context, let's start here with a free body diagram. So my free body diagram, I'll draw over here. And I'll draw this down at point A. We know that some of these angles are going to change over time, but we'll just go with here. So if the pulley at C is also friction free, then we know that this is 50 pounds. I'm going to have a normal force, probably, I'm not really sure exactly what direction it's going, either perpendicular above AB or perpendicular below. I also know here that vertically downwards, here is a 30-pound weight force. And then let's assume, I know I'm kind of combining locations here, but I do need to add my spring force. Now, the spring force doesn't apply the entire distance, but it is one of the forces which is applied. And let me just put a little note on here that we have an angle. That angle is this angle here. I'm going to call this theta. And just a little note here, this varies. Okay, it varies according to the location of that collar. The other forces turn out to be, they don't vary in angle. Um, they technically could vary in magnitude, but we won't get into that in too much right now. Actually, we don't need to worry about that, and I'll tell you why we don't need to worry about that. So going through these forces. First of all, we know that our gravitational potential energy will take care of our spring, excuse me, take care of our weight force. Okay, so that weight force will be taken care of as an energy term. We also know that the spring energy will take care of the spring force. So here is this 50 pounds. This is one of those external forces. This needs to be included in the W prime from one to two. And then the normal force, right, our displacement is going to be up this arm. Okay, so that would be my R. And given that that R is perpendicular to N, we have no work from the normal force. Okay, so really just one force overall that will be included in our work term. So let's go ahead and write out our full equation and move forward from there. So we have 1 half mv1 squared plus mgh1 plus 1 half k delta 1 squared plus w prime from 1 to 2. That's equal to my kinetic energy final 
plus my gravitational potential energy final plus my one half k delta two squared. All right. Um, additional thing that we know is that initial should be obvious here, but the spring's not attached to the collar. And so if the spring isn't attached to the collar, there's there's no basically the spring should be sitting at neutral. Um, when the particle is at A. Now I could have labeled these subscripts as A and B. I left them as one and two, noting that one is A, two is at B. Now I think it's most convenient to go ahead and pick a datum, which is down here at the lowest position possible. Okay, so my datum for H is gonna be at the bottom. Therefore, we have no height from our datum initial. And we also know here that our good friend starts at rest, that we have no initial velocity. So it turns out we have like no energy at all, initial, but we're adding some work and we're gonna have some final energy stored in the system. Okay, so I think we're probably pretty comfortable filling in those last three terms. Let's focus on this guy, this work term. So if we take an approach of trying to find the amount of force, which is parallel to the displacement R, noting that R, as we look at the geometry, we have 30 inches from B to C, we have 40 inches from one to two, so basically R is 40 inches long. So we could write that our, um, our work prime from one to two, now again, this is taking a particle approach, which in the end is not the approach I'm going to recommend, but let's take a look at it. Okay, so we said in a particle-based approach, fundamentally we're going to have an integral of F sub T dotted with dr. So filling in the terms here, we know we're going to integrate this over the full length of R, 0 to 40. And the amount of that force that's that's basically along this line here, get my pre-body diagram up there, is going to be the force cosine of theta, right? Cosine being the adjacent side right here. So I could write that that's going to be the value of 50 cosine of theta. That's basically my F sub T. But then I have to, and actually write the rest of this out. So this is 50 cosine of theta. Um, that's that one. And then dr. Okay. The challenge here is that theta varies with r. And so I have to basically do a substitution. And my substitution looks like this. I still have the integral from 0 to 40. Now I have my 50 times my cosine. So figuring out how theta varies with R. Now I'm going to write this, and you're welcome to stop the video and see if you can back solve where this comes from. But it basically comes into a tangent, that's the inverse tangent, of 30 over S. Okay, now that we're integrating with respect to S, instead of dr, this ends up being dS. Okay, and ds essentially looking at the distance along the path. So if I create this right triangle, which is ABC, noting that this side over here is 30, the distance between B up to C, this is a right triangle corner. So what I'm doing here is I'm basically saying that if I have a subset of this triangle, that my distance from zero to B I'm calling S, that this angle here is theta, it's still a right triangle, so the opposite over the adjacent using the inverse tangent is the is this term right here, right? The inverse tangent of 30 over s is equal to theta. Okay, so this whole thing here equals theta. So that equation works, but I'm not saying it's easy. Okay, um, the one I recommend instead is taking a system-based approach. Okay, so the question here is looking at fundamentally how far does this 50-pound force move 
as the collar goes from one to two. Okay, so how far does the force move? Another way we could say that is how much cable is played out between location one and location two. So an alternate version to this very complicated equation here is that W prime from one to two, right, noting that this has everything to do or both these equations are focused just on this 50 pound force. So W prime from one to two is going to equal the magnitude of that force, which is 50 pounds, and the distance that the force travels. Okay, the distance, we can basically think about an initial length from A to C, and then we have a final length from A to C, excuse me, from B to C, and the difference in the length of that cable is the amount of distance that the 50 pound force moved. Okay, so coming back down to my equation, I can write that this is 50 pounds times 50 inches, my initial length, minus 30 inches, my final length. I'm going to divide this by 12. Basically, the reason I'm dividing by 12 is to get it into feet versus in inches. We talked a bit about trying to get all of our problems into feet, seconds, um, as opposed to inches, especially if it involves gravity. So these two work terms are computationally equivalent. One of them is just way easier because we took a system approach. And the other one, we took more of a particle-based approach computation. But when that angle is changing, right, we have a force at a changing angle, usually think about going with a system-based approach. So bringing all this together, putting in the terms into our equation. Once again, on the left-hand side of our equation, all we had was our work term. It is positive because we have the force going in the direction of displacement. So 50 minus 30, once again, converting this into feet. So this would be in pound feet. And then on the right-hand side, we have our kinetic energy term. Our given weight of the collar, right, was 30 pounds. That is not a mass. We have to divide by 32.2, gravitational constant in feet per second squared, turning that into slugs. That and that becomes uh, our unknown V2 squared. We then also have our MGH. Now let's take a look at that here real quick. And really that one's based upon, I know my drawing is getting a little, little full here, but um, it's based upon this triangle in red where our hypotenuse is 40 and our angle here is 30. Okay, so the total height change is going to be 40 sine of 30 is the distance, uh, we'll go over here, is this distance over here, right? That's the elevation gain from A to B. And so here is gravitational potential term. Again, I can either basically write my 30 and turn it into a mass, but I'm gonna multiply again by gravity. So realize that mg is just your weight. So I can just write that as 30 pounds. That's my mg. And then for the height above the datum, so we had a travel distance of 40 inches. Let's go ahead and write out this conversion here just for transparency. So we're going to convert that into feet. So one foot divided by 12 inches. We'll end up canceling out those inches, leaving me with feet. So that's the total travel distance, but that isn't the height, right? The height, this is actually the hypotenuse of this right triangle up here we actually want to find this vertical distance from the datum up here to b so we'll take the hypotenuse length times the sine of 30 degrees okay so this whole thing here all the way from here to here is my height and then the last term we have is the spring energy and the spring energy is always positive because we square the delta term so that's going to be one half my k value is 200 that's in pounds per foot. And then we want to make sure that we put our delta in feet as well. And so I'll just go ahead and convert that. Six inches is one half foot. And we square the delta term. All right. So with all of these different values, we then can compute our value of V2. So plugging through the numbers, we find that V2 is equal to 4.23 
and in US customer units. And since we converted all this over into feet instead of leaving things in inches, this would be in feet per second. So that is my final velocity. Call it V2, call it VB if you wanted to. It's that velocity there um, at the end point, at point B. So let's go ahead and roll through this one more time, kind of talk through it. So we started this problem by writing out our full work and energy equation, all of the different terms here, which um, you really should do in order to um, just show all the different possibilities and also show me what, that you know which things go to zero. Uh, we had actually multiple things go to zero here on the left-hand side. We had that the particle or the collar started at rest, so therefore the first kinetic energy term went to zero. Because of where we established the datum here at point A, we had height one equal to zero. And we also had the spring unengaged to start with, right? Not stretched. So our delta one was also equal to zero. We had a work term here in the middle that we computed two different ways. We computed both with a particle-based approach, which is pretty complex in, in its geometry, trying to figure out how does that work term vary with angle and then integrating that over our total distance. And so this term here and this term here are completely equal, the particle-based approach and the system-based approach. I just advise that the system-based approach is lots and lots easier. And certainly on problems where you have even less information, this was a triangle problem, right? So we're able to fall back on some triangular trig in order to compute this one up here. Other problems, you may not have that triangular tool available. And so taking a system-based approach is gonna be the easiest way to go. And so we computed that noting here, here, this 12 in the bottom, just to be explicit, this is inches per feet, just to convert those um, total inches of 20 into feet. And then on the right-hand side, we essentially had all three energy terms. We put the values here into our overall equation, again, doing all of our unit conversions, making sure that we recognize that all pounds are pounds force. So we need to convert this fundamentally into slugs for the, any of the mass terms, anywhere it showed up as an mg, sorry, not this one here, but this one over here, um, where we want the weight of the collar, we could just leave it as 30 pounds, right? All pounds are pounds force. We do not use pounds mass in dynamics. All right, so then we went ahead and computed V2. Uh, don't forget to take the square root. That's something I see students do quite a bit. You get all this work done in here um, and essentially add these different things up, subtract them over on the other side, divide by this term right here, and then forget to take the square root. Okay, it's kind of anticlimactic to end up with the basically a V squared versus the velocity. So I appreciate your attention in looking through this example and I hope you're having an awesome day.